Part 2. Chapter 6. The Mind the Plastic or Formative Principle of the Body. There are two things in regard to the relation of mind and body that are self-evident to the intuitive reason. First, that the mind is the only life of the body. That there is no indefinable and mysterious something in our bodily organism distinct and separate from the soul which is the cause of all vital action. Life is a force, a spiritual principle of motion. Secondly, every movement of the body, physiological or muscular or functional, in every conceivable bodily state as to health or disease, strength or weakness, are effects of which some action of mind, conscious or unconscious, is the efficient and only cause. As Emmanuel Hermann Fichte has said, an individual soul must be at the basis of these physical facts for this reason, that all the processes of life are at the same time instinctive actions, that is, an unconscious kind of thought, which it would be absurd to locate anywhere but in the soul itself. One thing we know, that certain changes of the body always follow certain determinate mental alterations. The soul is the plastic principle, that is, it gives arrangement and form to the matter of which the body is composed. It builds up the organism and forms the body so as to adapt it to the wants and uses of its own nature. In this constructive effort, this geometric activity, it acts unconsciously to us, but with the highest intelligence originally impressed upon it something like the artistic effort of the bee in forming its cell in the most exact mathematical proportions, so as to contain the largest quantity in the smallest compass. The mind is thus the organizing principle. It has priority of existence. It precedes all bodily organization and accompanies it as a cause in the process of all its changes. It alters the condition of the body to harmonize it with its own states. It works silently, instinctively, and with an unconscious but unerring intelligence, and by an invariable law, to effect this result. For it is a law of God that spirit should control and govern matter, and the body outwardly express the mind. The whole bodily structure is changed in a brief period. It is an old opinion, formerly current in physiology, that the body is renewed once in seven years, so that no particle of matter now enters into the different tissues that was there seven years ago. But this change takes place much more rapidly and in a far shorter period than was formerly supposed to be requisite. It is 30W thought to be accomplished in one year. It is not unreasonable to suppose that this renewal of the body is effected in one mouth, or, at the farthest, once in three months. The amount of waste, worn-out material which passes off through the various excreting channels is, in a very limited time, equal to the weight of the whole body. But all this renewal and disintegration of cells and tissues is affected by the plastic influence of the mind. The soul is in this case the intelligent but unconscious agent in the change, exercising a sort of providence over the world of its creation. All these morphological changes and organic activities are affected by the mind through an intelligent instinct, but acting beyond the range of our ordinary sense consciousness. If the mind and its spiritual forces and influences are the plastic or formative principle of the body, then it follows that to change our mental states must of necessity modify our bodily condition. This is demonstrably true as a fact of experience. If, then, we make to ourselves a new heart and a new spirit, or change our affectional and intellectual states, the unconscious instinctive action of the changed and renewed mind will form to itself a body in harmony with itself. Fichte supposes that the mind, as the plastic or organizing principle, affects these changes in the body, in renewing and building up the physical structure, by a power which he calls fancy. By Tills he does not mean what is usually called imagination, HUD intelligence in its instinctive and spontaneous operation. But this creative power sometimes rises from the preconscious range of mental action and exhibits itself in the highest efforts of artistic genius, which are only the outward expression, in a permanent form, of internal all de pre existing ideas or mental creations. But if this mental power affects such changes in the body, when acting as an unconscious and intelligent instinct, why may it not be possible for us to direct it to the changing of our bodily organism and disease by a conscious volitional effort? Is not imagination a mode of force, that is, a spiritually creative power? And if so, ought it not to be taken into account in all our remedial devices? If a condemned criminal, from the trickling of warm water over the arm and supposing or imagining or fancying 
it to be blood from a divided artery, actually died, without the loss of a drop of blood, why may it not act with the same efficiency in prolonging life, and in affecting those organic and functional changes that constitute the cure of what we call bodily disease? Imagination or fancy may create disease, as physiologists admit, and why may it not be intelligently employed to cure it? There have been collected and preserved in the science of medicine many well-authenticated facts showing the manifold all depositive effects of the fancy upon the bodily organism, so that there is no room to call in question its vast formative power and influence in modifying our physical condition both in the direction of disease and health. What no one doubts we need not waste time in formally proving by an array of cases. This is as well established as any principle in what goes under the name of medical science. The morbific effects of the imagination upon the bodily condition are as fully proved as the action of arsenic or prussic acid. But it seems to me self-evident that such a power can be made to produce the highest therapeutic results just as well. It is manifest that we have here an almost unused and undeveloped principle of great practical value in the cure of disease. All the great discoveries of modern times, as the expansive power of steam, the electric telegraph, and the telephone, have left in the public mind a suspicion that there are yet many latent and unused powers of nature that await discovery, and that may be turned to a useful employment. It is possible that in what we have said in this chapter, there may be a principle of great practical value in its application to the cure of diseases of both mind and body. It is possible that we have made some approach towards the discovery of the natural, and consequently the divine, method of cure. Let anyone intelligently bring this creative and plastic power of the mind to the cure of his malady, and he will find it a most potential spiritual remedy. Let him, by a conscious volitional effort, employ this artistic instinct, this plastic influence of the mind, upon a diseased organ and fancy, or intelligently imagine, that it is becoming changed for the better, and that within a given time it will be well, and he will be astonished at the therapeutic result. The more fully he can make himself believe that the necessary change is being effected, or will be accomplished in an hour, a day, or a week, the more marked will be the result. For faith is the most intense form of voluntary mental action. Why should we not be able to believe this? For it is only the same power at work that, in the preconscious region of mental activity, carries on all the organic and physiological movements in building up the body from the cradle to the grave. Only in the supposed case it is combined with, and aided by, a voluntary and conscious mental effort. This is calling to our aid, in a time of need, the only power in nature that can change the bodily tissues and excite the various organs to their proper functional movements. The soul possesses a most marvelous plastic power, and this formative element in the body can be made to accomplish far more than could be affected by any general physical or chemical laws. If, as an unconscious but intelligent instinct and impulse, it presides over all the involuntary processes of life. May not its action be intensified and accelerated by a voluntary effort of thought working in harmony with it and in the same direction? The science of medicine will never be able successfully to combat disease until it takes as its foundation principle the words of Jesus the Christ. It is the spirit that mocketh alive, the flesh provides nothing. The individual mind as an image of God, and standing at the summit of creation, is God's vicegerent, and, by virtue of a power perpetually derived from him, is, in a secondary sense, a creator, or, if that be deemed too strong an expression, it is a modifier of the condition of its own body, the world of its formation. It can generate a new status of the corporeal organism where its reign is supreme. If, when we are sad, we can make our face to smile, or, when inwardly disturbed, can cause the body to wear the outward appearance of tranquility, or, when in danger, can check the two rapid pulsations of the heart, and be self-possessed and self-poised. Or, if under an otherwise painful surgical operation, as has often been done, the brave soul can triumph over pain so as to lessen its intensity, if not to become wholly insensible to it, then, by an intelligent use of this divinely ordained dominion of the mind over the body, a diseased organ can be controlled, and its morbid condition changed. If we were properly instructed in the use of the power inherent in the very nature of the mind, in nearly all cases of disease, especially in their incipient stage, the services of a physician would become unnecessary, 
the common practice of running to a physician in every ailment would be far less frequent, and the sale and use of drugs would be largely diminished. 